Hi everyone, it's Pam Lanuri, Head of Expedition Operations at Noble Caledonia, and we are chatting to Phoebe Olson, who's done her Masters in Archaeology, and we're very lucky to have Phoebe. She's been working for us for a number of years in little places all over the world on quite a few of our vessels, and we don't normally get to have an archaeologist along, but uh, with Phoebe, she's the full package. She's this amazing archaeologist as well as a kick butt driver and guide and everything else. And in fact, Phoebe is going to be expedition leader this coming season in the British Isles. So I hope that doesn't take too much away from uh, you bringing archaeology to us. But Phoebe's in Ireland at the moment. And how are you? I'm very good. Uh, and it's a lovely sunny day here. I've just had to close the curtains over so that I'm not blinded. Uh, and it's a, it's a great problem to have in March here. So it's lovely. You said you're in, in the south coast? Yeah, on the south coast. So down in uh, West Cork. Oh gosh, okay, so hopefully it starts warming up for you soon. So um, like I said, we don't have a lot of archaeologists on the box, so many of our trips, we don't run them with an archaeologist on board. We'll try to get a bird, a historian, geologist, marine mammologist, all these kinds of things, but there's just not too many archaeologists that we can bring to join us, and it's such a bonus when you can add that whole other dimension to voyages, and some are more obvious than others where an archaeologist would be great. But as Phoebe will probably be able to tell you better than me, anywhere you go in the world, you can actually benefit from having an archaeologist. And Phoebe, in your view, what do you think really, you know, lends the voyage extra kudos how having an archaeologist along? Well, of course, I might be biased, but I think you should always have an archaeologist on board. Um, I suppose uh, the main thing we bring is that not all archaeology is obvious. I mean, the idea of archaeology is generally it's underground, so it's difficult to spot and you don't always have, you know, things like large stone circles or a ginormous castle to show you here be the archaeology, this is where you should be looking. Maybe it's just something as simple as some lumps and bumps in the landscape, which as you're driving past them in your bus going from, you know, the ship to the best birding site, you know, in the Orkneys, um, maybe those lumps and bumps have more to tell you. And maybe what they're telling you is that there was a huge Iron Age settlement there. Maybe they are just um, patterns of field plowing. You end up with ridge and furrow, you know, maybe, maybe it was a Neolithic site, but it's just been covered over maybe by sand dunes. You don't always know where the archeology span is. And sometimes there are no clues whatsoever. And archeologists then we study the landscape and we'll be able to tell you the story of the past of that landscape even though there aren't necessarily huge monuments to signpost it for you. Yes, thanks so much. Yeah, because there's obviously all the better known sites that we'll specifically try and go to, Scarabray or Ring of Brodga comes to mind. But then all the time there's signs and middens and things that most of us would be none the wiser. It's just, there's been over the years a few exciting moments on trips where we've, uh, our archaeologist, you, or um, there's another lady who we've worked with as well, and spots a site and then registers it with um, the archaeological bank, I suppose. One <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, that comes to mind was a Viking site and she, she registered it with um, a site bank for these, these sites that it was quite exciting. You know, we were there, we found it, so it was cool. Um, so closer to home, you've now done voyage with us all over the world. Closer to home, in around the North Atlantic and the, the outer islands around Britain, what jumps to you as being the more significant highlights or maybe lesser known highlights even around the area? Well, I suppose in and around um, Britain and Ireland, um, for me, uh, when I talk about archaeological sites, uh, me personally, I prefer prehistory. So, you know, we're starting back in the kind of Mesolithic, through the Neolithic, Bronze Age, and into the Iron Age. Uh, the Vikings then, of course, and then after that, once we get into historic archaeology, uh, though it is fascinating, it's not necessarily my area. So I concentrate more on that prehistory side of things. And what is so wonderful about uh, up here around Britain and Ireland is that we have a whole heap of it and it's a lot of it is actually readily visible in the landscape especially back in the neolithic period when they're monument building and they're doing it in stone which is extremely convenient for us because uh, it's still there <laughs> instead yeah. of 
building things out of wood, which uh, wasn't wasn't so super. So that's one of the I suppose one of the joys of um, being up here. You can see these you can see these things, and they are thousands and thousands of years old, and they're still sitting there. Yeah, well, some of them are still sitting there in the landscape. So talking about visiting archaeological sites around the North Atlantic, we're really starting, like I said, in the Neolithic period. Beforehand in the Mesolithic, there aren't so many settlements and they're not monument building. It's in the Neolithic around four, between 4000 and 2500 BC. So we're talking between like six and 4000 years ago. That's when we started farming really and that's when we started to uh, settle more permanently and that's when we started monument building that's when uh, we started heaving up big stones and thinking that that was the best idea ever <laughs> and we still maybe understand why. i don't know if that um period is so prominent especially for the uk as i understand it not so much you won't necessarily see a lot of signs all around the world at that same time, but it's really good around the UK, is that right? It's particularly good in around um, the UK and Ireland. There are certain things that we do up here, or we did up here, that you don't find elsewhere. I mean, henges, big, those big hengeform enclosures, earthwork enclosures with large stone circles. You do find stone circles elsewhere in the world. Um, you find them in Aboriginal Australia and you can find them in Turkey, but really it was very nearly uh, distinctly um, Britain, Britain and Ireland. The, this is a place where you will find stone circles and the largest stone circles in the world more uh, permanent um, habitats and especially when you go further north especially up in Scotland you don't have a whole heap of trees so if you're going to be building your house and there aren't a lot of trees but what you do have is a lot of rock you're going to be building out of stone and you need permanent structures that are going to withstand the weather that you have up there whereas when you're in the tropics it's a it's a completely different setup down there you don't have such um you don't have uh, structures or settlement dwellings that survive as long because if you're building it out of organic material and especially in the tropics like that's not going to last a couple of years never to mind thousands yes. and thousands of years because it always strikes me as you know i don't know if it's just better studied there in britain and ireland or it's just that there's more evidence of it and you know um, much more going on in that period but it always strikes me that there's something interesting to see from that neolithic era um even although you do make a good point mind. sorry yeah you do make a good point like we do we study it up here you know we have uh the time the resources the universities the funding um here that uh we can spend the time and, and elsewhere in Europe where there are areas in the world where they might have, or I'm sure they do, just as fascinating archaeology. Maybe they have things that we've never seen before, but if you don't have the time and the funding in order to explore it, you're just not going to know about it. Yes. So it's about looking for it everywhere. Yes. So tell us a bit about your favourite sites around the area. Okay, so uh, like I said, we're sort of starting in the Neolithic period. That's when we're building uh, more uh, permanent settlements and we start uh, monument building your megalithic tombs. So tombs using megaliths, ginormous stones. Um, this then continues into the Bronze Age, that idea of me megalithic stones. But you also start getting barrows and burial mounds. So those kind of lumps and bumps in this landscape, you particularly see them in and around Stonehenge, these barrows, these burial mounds. That's between 2500 to 800 BC. Then we move into the Iron Age uh, between 800 to 43 AD. And then you start getting larger buildings. And that's when, especially up in Scotland, you get your, um, was it the Atlantic dry stone walled construction buildings or your big brocks, your big wheelhouses, these big stone windowless towers that are just so mysterious in the landscape. It's like they've been dropped out of the sky um, and you get an increase of enclosed settlements. So looking particularly at those three periods, I have a couple of um, favourite sites in and around the islands. Great, um, yeah. 
So good. So we'll start, and I was going to start maybe geographically start low down. So we'll start in the in the Sillies, and the Sillies actually has a wealth of Bronze Age sites, uh, and then we'll head up to Scotland and go to the Outer Hebrides to the Isle of Lewis, and we'll see the Iron Age in one of those large brocks. A uh, quick game of chess, and then we'll head to Orkney for uh, the Neolithic, and Orkney is where they just do the Neolithic so well. <laughs> we just have the most amazing sites there. And then finally up to Shetlands and have a look at the multi-period site of Jarlshof, which sort of knits everything together. You can see all these periods stacked up sort of on top of each other in one site. Well, let's and go. Like That's about the only trip any of us are doing this March. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. What else are you doing on Monday? Um, so, uh, Silly, it actually has, so the answer Silly has like a remarkable number of Bronze Age sites. And actually, I'll just start because um, I have a map here. There we go. Got it. So here we go, the Isles of Scilly, not the Scilly Isles, we're not allowed to say that, they don't like that. Um, so it was more permanently settled from the Bronze Age. So you have evidence from earlier times in the Neolithic, Mesolithic, the Stone Ages, there's evidence of periodic settlement, but people came and then they left again. They were more permanently settled then from the Bronze Age, so we're talking 2500 years BC. And that is when they started farming there on a large scale. And there's a lot of evidence for settlements. Um, there's about 150 roundhouses. And I know I've zoomed in a lot there, but if you zoom out twice so you can see the rest of Britain, you know, the city isles, they just disappear on Google Maps. <laughs> They're just yeah. so tiny. So you've got 150 roundhouses sitting there, field systems. But really, when it comes to the archaeology that is uh, that you can visit and readily see in the landscape there, it's the ceremonial monuments. Um, the most impressive of these are the entrance graves, which essentially does what it says on the tin. They're graves that have an entrance and there are over 80 in the City Isles. Uh, the one I suppose that I would There we go. Oh, so there's Bronze Age City. So if you look at the coastline as well, everything is shifting and changing. So you have in the middle here in that green area, fertile plain, field walls, houses, graves, which is now underwater. And we actually, uh, we sail our ships over that now. It's so nice and deep, you know, <laughs> we're, we're pootling along in there, no problems. So it was actually much, a much wider area. So what we have is actually tiny compared to what was there before. And we still have 80 megalithic tombs. We have 150 roundhouses, even in these tiny areas. And Phoebe, do you have to learn calligraphy as part of your course so you can do cool maps and stuff? <laughs> oh, no, I'm naturally gifted when it comes to calligraphy. Yeah, I have beautiful, beautiful handwriting. <laughs> no. um, oh, it's nice. I really like that map. It's gorgeous. It's great. Um, so here we have one of these entrance uh, entrance graves, and this is Innes Idgin, and it's on St. Mary's. Um, it's, as you can see there, it's roughly circular in shape. It's made up of stone and earth, and then inside there is a rectangular chamber, and it's built with these big slabs of stone in the inside, and you can go inside and look. Normally what was placed inside were cremated remains. So we're in the Bronze Age. They like cremating people. Um, cremated remains along with some grave goods, you'd have maybe some Bronze Age, uh, bronze artifacts, uh, glass beads have been found in them, hammer stones, anything else you'd need uh, in, your, in your lovely little entrance grave here. And what's gorgeous about this one and so many of them around, around um, the Sillies is that you can go in and have a look. Just honestly mind your head. You know, these things are, these are not, these are not dwellings. They're not designed to go in and out of. So you just go in and have a look. And it's just sitting there in the landscape. It's not fenced off or anything. So you just need to be very careful as you're going in. Um, and that's what's particularly special about this one. But like I said, there are 80 in and around the yeah. islands. This is just one of them or one of the best preserved ones. Then if you're on St. Agnes, there's this area here, and this area is called Wingletang Down, which is really difficult to say, uh, on St. Agnes. And this area has 43 cairns in it. Uh, but the, <laughs> the fun thing to do here, or fun if you're me or interested in archeology, span is play 
find the archaeology because it's basically uh, just this area covered in heather and gorse and rocky outcrops and large granite boulders and you have to play spot the archaeology what is a natural rocky outcrop what has been deliberately constructed and you can weave your way down all the way through here so i have another uh, picture here so there we go so there are some of the rocky outcrops this fella here is known as the devil's punch bowl and it's all covered in gorse and you just wind your way along the paths and see how many you can spot you're just yeah it's just where's wally of archaeology um then once you're finished on St Agnes, then you can walk across uh, the Tombola. This is a picture of us uh, walking across. You have to wait till low tide so you can walk across to the uh, small adjacent island of Goo. And on Goo, you can then visit the old man. Oh, beg your pardon. Oh no, I'm not going to be able to go back. Huzzah. The old man of Goo. So the old man of Goo, so he's a bit rarer so he is a rare more enigmatic bronze age feature so now we sort of feel like we've seen a lot of cairns we've seen a lot of entrance graves there are 80 of them around the place there are only eight of these standing stones here so he is only one of also known as a menir uh, there's one of eight and we're still not entirely sure what they would have been so you can stand there and wonder okay well is it a grave marker is it a memorial stone for someone or maybe something that happened in this place that they wanted to retain the memory of this place. Um, is it a territorial marker? Is it pointing to something or away something? Or has it just sort of fallen over over time and got a bit tired? Who knows? So he's just there sticking up out of the landscape, the old man of goo. And then an honourable mention, of course, when we go to Tresco, we visit those beautiful gardens, especially when we have um, a fabulous botanist on board and the birders, and you can see their, um, the fab birds that they have there. Uh, when you're in there, there are medieval ruins of St. Nicholas's Priory is also there, but oh, it's a bit yeah. recent for me. It's a bit recent for me, but I understand why other people might want to go see it. But, you know, no judgment yeah. for me, like what you like. Yeah, Phoebe, all those questions about the old man of view, it just, when you're standing there, it just gives you this lovely sense of, you know, being connected across the centuries and, you know, thousands of years of connections of, of humans being there, and especially in such a beautiful wilderness type of area, and then having, you know, these stones where we still know so little about what's going on there, just as you saying what it brings to a trip, it just brings that sense of um, timelessness and zooming out into the bigger picture of our human existence on earth. So yeah, very, very cool that there's so much we actually still don't know. Oh, and that's the joy of it. I mean, we don't have all the answers, not by a long shot. And especially in a little bit when I start talking about Brock's, you know, their entire buildings, how do we still not understand them? And the wonderful thing is all these theories and all this debate, and you can go and visit these monuments and make your own mind up, stand there looking at the old man of goo and go, what are you? I feel like you're this and no one can say you're wrong really because we don't actually know and that's the nice thing about archaeology well that's the thing that i like about it mm -hmm. but uh so there's the uh isles of a uh, couple of things on the Isles, uh the Isles of silly um but like i said there's absolutely heaps of it around and especially when we have time to walk around these areas and we do like to give people time to walk around these areas a little bit before we have to go back and make your own mind up about what you like about it and then we'll zoom all the way up north and head up to the outer hebrides we're up in scotland now and we're moving forward in time so we've just been in the bronze age and now we're moving up to the iron age so this started about 1800 BC. Uh, oh no, I beg your pardon. That's not right at all. Um, since 1800 BC, we have been building round things. We really like round up in Britain and Ireland. Uh, round houses, round huts, circular stone structures, we love all of that. And it's actually quite unique within Europe. Once you go across that, the channel and you head down into mainland Europe, a lot of uh, Bronze Age farmsteads and things are dominated by rectangular buildings. So growing up, I'm sure other people feel the same, growing up and learning about history and archaeology in Ireland and those who have done the same over in Britain, we feel like round huts is the dominant feature of all prehistory. 
but it isn't. It's the dominant feature of our prehistory. It's actually quite a specific characteristic that we just have up here in these islands. And this roundhouse shape um, became the dominant um, characteristic for settlement for 2000 years. We were building round things for a very long time until the Romans came up and ruined it with their love of rectangles. But <laughs> um, and then moving then into the Iron Age then, and we keep that, that round shape, that round settlement type. Um, and these roundhouses that were already unique to us in Britain and Ireland, and then we take it one step further. And then in the Iron Age up in Scotland, uh, they start building Atlantic dry stone roundhouses. So same shape, same idea, starting building everything out of stone and things start getting bigger and more monumental. Then they started building what we what are now known as brochs, so B-R-O-C-H-S, brochs, and they started them around 200 BC. These were designed to be monumental and impressive in the landscape. You were going to notice these things. They were highly visible. They were prominent. They flouted environmental conditions. You're living up there and it's really windy. Do you want a tall house? Not necessarily. Did they build them? Absolutely. Um, they consumed huge quantities of stone. You know, it's taking a lot of work in the Iron Age to quarry stone and drag it places and build structures. You know, this is no easy thing. You would be better off building a wattle and daub if you wanted something quick and cozy. Um, they are, like I said, they are actually quite mysterious, which seems bizarre to us because we have so many really lovely, uh, well-preserved examples of them in the landscape. So how do we not understand them? And yet here we are. Um, we still don't have definitive dates of when they started building them and when they ended. So 200 BC is an approximation. Um, we still don't really know how they were roofed. Uh, anyone who has sailed with uh, Chris Edwards, our geologist, um, he has a, what I would call an obsession with brocks, but I don't think that's what he calls. He, he loves them and his thing is, how were they roofed? Because if we didn't have a lot of timber up here, how were you going to roof this enormous structure? Did you thatch it? Did you go across cords instead of straight across? Were they floored? Were they only partially roofed? We still don't know. We can only uh, speculate, do some experimental archeology span and see if what we've done works or if it completely falls apart. We don't know what some of the internal features were. There are all these wall voids. And we think, oh, well, was it a ladder? Was it for placing objects in? But ultimately what it does is it actually destabilizes the building. Why would you add a feature that destabilizes your building? Yeah. We don't know. And what else there? Still don't even know entirely what they were used for. Were they lived in permanently? Were they structures that people retreated to out of the landscape to hide when there was raiding and then come back out again when everything was safe? Was it the Lord's house, you know, uh, the local Lord? We don't know. But we do, what we do know is that they were built to impress. They are approximately 2000 years old and they're approximately 700 of them recorded in Scotland, mostly in the north and the west. And one of the ones that uh, we visit, oh yes, so here's a reconstruction of one of our lovely uh, round houses. This is what we were living in, in the Bronze Age and Iron Age. And this is what then developed. So this is Dun Carloway on the Isle of Lewis. Uh, and this is one of the ones that we visit. And it is absolutely stunning. It is just sitting there in the landscape, dominating everything around it. And um, in my head, I call it done cutaway because it looks like a model where you've sliced off part of it. You can see all the internal, internal structures. You can see that double wall structure. You can see those wall voids, they're just here. The ones that actually uh, weaken the structure somewhat. You have your low doorway here on the inside. We have what are known as guard cells. And again, walk in, sit in it, decide what you think it was or what each of the features were. You can climb up very carefully. And again, mind your head. I'm not a very tall woman and I've hit my head on this. So find yourselves climbing up and looking at them. And here we have Chris Edwards, here he is contemplating brocks and all their meanings, <laughs> thinking about roofs. 
and you sit in there and you can again climb climb into it sit in it look up and the wonderful thing about it is that even though it is cut away it retains the majority of its original height so about 9.2 meters high when i had so i have a book on Brox because of course i do um <laughs> <laughs> on the very first page listed as one of the finest examples of Brox still surviving today Don Carloway is number two it, you have Musa, which is more complete up in the Shetlands, but you don't have that cutaway feature. You can't see the double wall structure. So to me, I actually think it's better to see this one so you can actually see how it was built. Um, why is there not so much of it left? Well, it has eroded and fallen over time, but also nearby you have the Garan and Black House village, which is from the 1800s, and they may have taken stones originally quarried for the building of the brock when the brock was out of use then they're like well we're not using them here over there i'm going to bring them over here and build my house so it is entirely possible that they were removed in order to build some of the structures that we then visit on the way so this is on the way to duncarl away we stop off in this village and you can see some of the traditional weaving techniques then in the houses as well Hello. And I suppose the honourable mention when people thinking about think about the archaeology of the Isle of Lewis, you're thinking about the Lewis chessmen. And unfortunately, currently, none of the Lewis chessmen are on Lewis, as far as I know. You can see them in the British Museum and you can see them in the National Museum of Scotland. Uh, but there has been a grant awarded to uh, to rejuvenate the facility that they have on the Isle of Lewis so they can actually permanently display, I think, six pieces there. And I feel that's so important. It's that decentralizing of the archaeology. It's bringing it back to where it originally came from. These fellows are carved mostly from walrus teeth, uh, walrus ivory, uh, some of them from whale. Um, they're small chess pieces. I have a uh, reconstructed one of the berserker here on the right who's uh, biting on his shield because he's just raring to go. He's going to kick some butt. He's very busy. And uh, it'd be nice for them to be back to the island where they were found. They were just found as part of a hoard and dug up. They date to the 12th century. So back when the Hebrides and a lot of the Scotland, uh, Scotland's islands were still part of the Scandinavian world. So they were, I think, originally carved in Trondheim up in Norway. So you have all these links going across. We think of Britain as being like, and the islands of um, Scotland all being part of Britain. But at that time, this belonged to a completely different world and center of power. Amazing. How many Lewis chessmen are there that we that we know of? Oh, I th I think there's a. F I think they have the full set, but. That's only, there were several other gaming pieces found as part of the hoard. Um, so not all of them are from the same set, if you know what I mean. Yes, but I think they have, it's the most complete set of, uh, of historical gaming pieces from that time, I believe. Yes, and you were saying out of walrus teeth, so pro probably not from local walrus, but that's a- yeah, Not that's local, no. Amazing, no, so actually, these little figures come up quite often on our trips as mentioned in various speakers' um, talks. Um, I think John Love mentions them quite a lot and he's a birder. Yeah. So um, <laughs> yeah, so a lot of connection, interesting connections there. Yeah, and this is the thing, it, they're good to mention because we'd be on the Isle of Lewis and that's where they were found. But even though they were carved up in Trondheim in Norway, um, but I think it's good that these things are coming back so that you can go and visit them in the place where they were found, which I always think is nice. Thanks so much, Phoebe. It's so interesting to take us on that little journey through the Isles of Scilly, the Bronze Age and all the Brocks. Now we have plenty more to speak about and next time we're going to do a talk right up into Neolithic Orkney, but that's enough for today. And I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, no, thank you for having me. All right, cheers. Bye-bye.